this is Oscar Schwab. He is a uh, PhD student in geography. Uh, he has his, uh, his bachelor's from the University of Oregon, and he is uh, working on a, a, a dissertation on Siberian regional identity. Uh, he spent a year on, on a Fulbright studying the separatist movement in Ukraine, and so uh, he is here today to speak a little bit about, uh, I think your, his topic changed a little bit, or the title at least, uh, but certainly on, on uh, Crimean uh, identity. So. All right. all right, thank you, Bart, and thank you all for being here. Set up here. So, uh, yes, this is a topic that I, I made the, the topic of my uh, master's thesis here in the geography department at KU. Um, uh, I'm calling it here Nationality, Territory, and the Formation of Crimean Russian Identity. Uh, and what we're looking at here, it might be a little hard to see, but uh, we've got two images. The first one is uh, the gate of the Russian Cultural Center in Simferopol in the capital of Crimea. And if you can't tell, there's, it's got the outline of Crimea. It's we will be talking about on here with the Kremlin Tower emblazoned upon it. Uh, pretty, uh, you know, political, politically charged here. Um, oh, on. Thanks. Uh, let's go on. I did this again at some point. But the other one is an advertisement also in Crimea that uh, says simply, we are Crimeans, right? For people, uh, various you know, children of various ethnic backgrounds coming together and proclaiming that they are collectively Crimeans. And these two images sort of highlight the two different sides of what I'm going to be talking about today, sort of Russian national identity in Crimea and Crimean regional identity. So let me give you a little background first. So what we're talking about here is it's, uh, known as the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. It's an autonomous republic in Ukraine. It's only an autonomous republic. Um, I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with, with this region. It could have been pointed out a map maybe, but for those who aren't, here it is. Here's Ukraine and Crimea right here. Oh, no. Oops, got my pointer. Take advantage of this. There it is. Um, let me give you a little breakdown of the uh, ethnic demographics here. Uh, it's about 60% Russian, making it the only region within Ukraine where uh, the population is a majority Russian. Not Russian speaking, much of it is, is, has a majority of Russian speakers, but it's the only region where a majority of the population is ethnically Russian. Uh, another 25% ethnically Ukrainian. 12% uh, are Crimean Tatars, which is an indigenous Muslim Turkic speaking group. And the remaining 3% is made up by uh, a number of various minority groups of, of different waves of, of immigrants that have come to the region um, over centuries, including Greeks, Germans, Armenians, Azeris, Bulgarians, and many others. All right, I want to give a little historical background about Crimea, kind of leading up to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, Crimea has sort of been a real crossroads of different cultures, different empires, different groups coming in for millennia. All right, I've just got a few, well, a bunch of different maps here showing different periods of Crimean's history and the groups that were there at the time. So it was a number of Greek colonies way back from ancient, ancient Greek times, right? And there are a large number of, well, not that large, but a, a, a significant Greek presence still in the region going back that far. Um, then we've got the Scythians coming through, being part of their empire. It was incorporated into the Roman Empire for a period. The Hazars were there. Goths had come down and settled in the region as well. Eventually it becomes part of the Golden Horde, you know, the, get the, the Mongolians coming through, eventually becomes its own separate Khanate kingdom within the Golden Horde, the Crimea Khanate, with its own Khan, um, which eventually becomes incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, right? And so it's a sort of this, it's this weird uh, balance of, of power between the local Khan and the, and the greater Ottoman Empire here. So that's kind of leading up to the Russian period. So in 1783, Crimea is annexed by the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great. And she makes a big show of it. It was, this, this, it was a, a, a very significant event for, for Russian history. It sort of announced uh, Russia's arrival of, of, as, a, as a European colonial power. It was seen as a, a, a significant part of the Orient. And Russia kind of wanted to get in on this, this colonial game in, the, in, the, in the, this part of the world, in, in the Muslim world. Uh, so they, they uh, annexed it, incorporated into the, the empire as the Tavrichesky uh, governorate. And there was this big grandiose tour that, that Catherine made with a, an entourage of, of her own you know, advisors, but also a number of, uh, of yeah, European figureheads and, and, and noble people. And they made this big show of touring through and then sort of looking at their new acquisition, this new you know, pearl of the, of the Orient being brought into the Russian Empire. And at the same time, there were parts about Crimea's history that were sort of rediscovered and made meaningful by its incorporation to Russia, namely, that supposedly, as the legend goes, Prince Vladimir of Kiev and Rus had accepted Christianity at, in a town called Kersones, um, which is the present day Sevastopol. And so this sort of becomes this big legend about you know, Crimea being the origins of 
uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, at least in Kievan Rus, and then from there it, it was transmitted to uh, Muscovy and became you know, the official religion of all of, of uh, you know, East Lapin. So that was really uh, you know, rein reinvigorated as, as a really important trope within uh, the Crimean story. But also, after this time, you get a lot of artists and poets and prominent cultural figures from Russia um, traveling to the region, writing about it, sort of using these, these Orientalist and, and um, you know, romantic tropes about the beauty of the region and its exoticness and, and all these things. And it becomes a real tradition of Crimean literature and art within you know, the greater Russian culture. So it's, it's, it becomes a, a very significant thing. Um, and a major event in 1853, 1856, the Crimean War, which, though not for Crimea per se, much of the, of the fighting took place there. It was between Russia on one side, uh, Britain, France, and the Ottoman Empire on the other, sort of you know, battling for, for influence in the region, and because, in the Black Sea region, and because Crimea is sort of right in the center there, much of the, of the fighting takes place there. And um, its significance for what we're dealing with is that, is again, the city of Sevastopol becomes a site of a major siege, a major battle, and with this, be the, we get the start of what's now often referred to as the Sevastopol myth of this, this place being this really important site of Russian national pride and defense of the motherland against foreign invaders. It was, it was completely destroyed. The, these fighters held out for a really, really long time. And uh, it's, it's a, a site of memorialization uh, for the, the, the battle fought there and the people lost. And it's become uh, also a very important uh, piece of the Crimean story for Russia. Um, later on, during the Soviet period, again, World War II uh, comes to Crimea, Germans invade Crimea. There's another, a second siege of Sevastopol, which you know, parallels the first in many ways. It's under siege for a long time. They fought diligently, held out, and um, the Sevastopol myth sort of becomes this two-tiered thing, where it's, it's, it, was, it was under siege once in the Crimean War, again, in World War II, and it just sort of escalates the legend behind the city and its importance for uh, Russian nationalism and Russian national pride, it, it takes it to a whole new level. Um, following the war, the Crimean Tatars, this group I had mentioned, um, they uh, are deported in 19, uh, 1944 en masse to Central Asia, mostly, and also other parts in, in Siberia and around the Soviet Union. Um, this was due to Stalin's um, uh, claim that they had collaborated with the Germans during the occupation. Um, you know, obviously, this is all very politically charged, and it, it falls into this pattern of a lot of deported peoples within the Soviet Union. But this is a major event for Crimea because it essentially makes the Crimean Peninsula a totally Slavic area, with minus maybe a few uh, small minorities left over. So it's all Russians and Ukrainians now. And up until this point, it had been an autonomous republic because of the presence of this, of this ethnic minority, the Crimean Tatars. But without them there, there's no longer a need for autonomy in this region, according to or Soviet nationality policies, and so in 1945, it loses its autonomous status and becomes the uh, just the Crimean Oblast of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic within the USSR. Right? Then in 1954, Khrushchev comes along and makes this big show of transferring Crimea to the Ukrainian SSSR within the Soviet Union. It's on uh, it marks the 300th anniversary of the Treaty of Pityaslov, which was seen as sort of the, the treaty that united Ukrainian and Russian lands, and so it was made this into this big show of the, you know, the, brother, the brotherhood between the Russians and Ukrainians. Um, but there, there were some other more pragmatic considerations that went into it too. And uh, following the war especially then, Crimea really becomes a major site of Soviet tourism. It's the prim premier beach destination in all of the Soviet Union. Right? There's all the workers have their, have their allotted uh, vacations and most of them inevitably end up in Crimea and there are sanatoria set up for specific industries and for people from specific factories. And it's basically, back then and even now, it would be very difficult to find anyone throughout the Soviet Union who hadn't been to Crimea at least once for vacation. It's really that important and that significant. All right, and then moving on to the post-Soviet period. Um, in February of 1991, just months before the, the fall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's a referendum held in Crimea to reestablish its autonomous status, the only such uh, referendum ever held in the Soviet Union. Um, so it does regain its, its autonomy on the eve of the breakup, which uh, enables them to sort of have leverage with Kiev as the, you know, the 90s begin uh, in negotiating the terms of their, of their autonomy. Uh, and for many years in the 90s, there was a specter of, of potential ethnic violence breaking out. Because in the meantime, you've also got the Crimean Tatars returning after their years of exile and having to set up in little shacks like this because all their homes were, were occupied when they returned. 
right? And so this is a difficult period in the 90s, and eventually ends in 1998 with uh, uh, the, the terms of the, of the Crimean Constitution and the balance of power between Simferopol and Kiev. But uh, another ongoing problem throughout this period, and still, is that the debate over the um, naval port of Sevastopol again, which is home to one of, uh, was, was one of the Soviet Union's most important uh, military installations, right? This is this important naval base, um, which it continues to lease from Ukraine. This was another another thing that was, was the, the subject of ongoing negotiations between Ukraine and Russia during this period. And uh, and they, they've since sort of extended that lease for another, through the, you know, 2040 something, uh, 2047 or so. So it's still, you know, a hot topic issue. Um, but it, it's important for Russia that they still have this toehold of, of uh, military power uh, there within a region that they kind of still see as, as one that was that was wrongfully lost by them to Ukraine in the breakup of the Soviet Union. And along with this, you have a pretty strong current of Russian nationalism among the Russians in Crimea because they feel like they, they don't really belong in Ukraine. They see this, this transfer that happened in 1954. Many of them claim it as being illegal, that Khrushchev didn't have the, the authority. Yeah. <laughs> Check the, uh, yeah, the 10 minutes to, yeah. Let's just go all out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, yes, they, they, they resent the fact that they are no longer part of what they see as being the homeland of their ethnic kin in Russia. And so you see you get a lot of demonstrations, like there's pro-Russian demonstrations happening quite, quite quickly in uh, Crimea. So that kind of brings me to this one important piece of what I'm talking about here is uh, Russian nationalism in Crimea. Um, and you see here another such demonstration. This for is a, a rally for this uh, political figure, Vitaly Dikhenko, who's this leader of this really pro-Russian, pro-communist uh, bloc within Ukraine, uh, broadly, but has really a pretty strong support in Crimea. Clearly, see a portrait of Stalin there in the middle. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, you can tell by the faces here. It's, it's largely a, a phenomenon among the older generations too, although they do you know, kind of pay some younger people to, to demonstrate in these as well. Um, but no, it's, it's a really it's a really big thing. You will hear Russians talking about the fact that they don't feel like they belong in Ukraine, that they feel they're, you know, uh, they were wronged by being severed from Russia and the fall of the Soviet Union. And so this has really dominated a lot of the political debates since the fall of the Soviet Union in Crimea. But at the same time, there's a very strong current of Crimean regional identity, which is manifested in a lot of ways, not just among Russians, but of people uh, of all ethnic backgrounds in the region. You see, this is just one example, I don't know if you can read this, it's kind of dark, but this is just a bus stop somewhere, and somebody spray painted, I love you, Crimea, on the back. Just You see you see this a lot, just sort of, you know, banal expressions of, of uh, love for Crimea, but attached to the region, of a sense of identity attached to this region. So, this is sort of the, the uh, interesting question that I have. Um, with this balance between a uh, Russian national identity in Crimea, but also a strong regional identity, an identity tied to this region specifically, that's no longer even part of Russia in a, in a technical sense. Um, well, another way that, that uh, this sort of this Crimean regional identity is manifested is in the Crimean logo map, which is a term used by uh, Benedict Anderson to describe the use of territorial imagery as sort of a marking of, of uh, collective identity within a space within an imagined community bounded within a territory. So Crimea, conveniently, is this peninsula, and it has this very distinct shape, right? There's no question of where it begins and where it ends, really. It's just barely attached to Ukraine. So you can use this, you can use this image in, in everyday things from you know, local businesses on their signs, graffiti, there's a bookstore just with, with the, the logo map there on it. Another sort of expression of uh, Crimean pride, right? We have identity here with it in the heart. So you see this, you see this a lot, just just kind of out and about in Crimea. You see this logo map; it's really used ubiquitously. So, putting it all together, well, at least the, the the Russian side of this and what Crimea means in these greater Russian national narratives. Um, some of the points that, that come out a lot when you when you look into this is that okay, one of the things is yes, its role in past wars, especially Sevastopol, and how it was this this major site of defense of the homeland and and uh, you know, a, a major thing in, in uh, Russian national pride as far as, as the, the defense of the motherland goes. And with that, the ongoing debate over the naval base there and Russia's right to, to maintain its presence there in a military sense. So that's an important part of the piece of the puzzle here. 
but also the way Crimea has been represented in, in uh, Russian literature from Pushkin, who's done a lot of did a lot of traveling and writing about it. You see here his picture on an ad for the International Festival of Russian Culture in Crimea, and but also a lot of the art and a lot of the you know even novels written about it, and it, 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 there's really a strong tradition of Crimean art and literature within Russian culture. Um, and along with that goes a lot of these these kind of Orientalist tropes about its beauty, how exotic it is, because it's subtropical along the southern coast where Yalta and a lot of these these uh, tourist destinations are. Um, of course, this is this is very different from from the vast bulk of the Russian territory being you know cold and flat and and bleak compared to compared to, uh, to Crimea. So this is this really is a, sort of the pearl of the Russian and Soviet Empire. And of course, with that, you get the, the strong uh, uh, tourist influence there, the fact that it is, it is such a major site for, uh, for tourists from Russia and from around the former Soviet Union, and that there are a lot of personal memories attached to the region for a lot of people having spent their time there in the summer. It was a site of a lot of, of uh, children's camps that, that a lot of Soviet children went to. One of the most famous is called Artek, which is sort of, you know, it's a big name in, in Soviet children's camps. Uh, so that's a, a personal association a lot of people have. And then again, the, uh, the uh, connection between Christianity, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy, and, and Russia as having begun in Crimea itself. So these are all things that go into the, the narrative about Crimea within you know, Russian nationalist narratives broadly. So this kind of all this brought me to some of my main questions here when doing my my thesis is how how do these two things come together? When we say there's something like a Crimean Russian identity, and if so, what would that mean? So some of the specific questions I was asking is. How do Russians in Crimea reconcile strong senses of both national and regional identity? Right? How can they be, you know, how to express their national identity so strongly as they do in Crimea, but also being so attached to this region at this very small scale? How can they like feel that they're from here and be so attached to it, but their sense of national identity transcends it so strongly? Um, do Russians in Crimea conceive of themselves as a distinct community? Do they see themselves as being okay, we are Russians in Crimea and we are different from other Russians? Or in other words, for Russians in Crimea, does their Russianness distinguish them from other Crimeans, or does their Crimeanness distinguish them from other Russians? Right? Do they see themselves as special among Crimeans because they are Russian? Do they see themselves as special among Russians because they live in Crimea? And what would a sense of Crimean Russian identity indicate exactly? What would it mean to exhibit a sense of Crimean Russian identity, if we're going to call it that? So in order to get this question, for my thesis, I conducted a survey in Crimea in the summer of 2011, which included 798 participants with the help of, uh, of some, some professors at the university in Simferopol. Can't take full credit for, for getting that many participants all on my own. Um, here we see some of my, my survey participants filling out their questionnaires. And uh, although I'm focusing on just the Russian aspect of all of this, I, I surveyed um, Ukrainians, Crimean Tatars, and other minorities as well. And they kind of all went into the the thesis itself, I had to pare it down mainly to the Russian, the Russian side of things for this presentation, unfortunately. Um, and then in order to sort of analyze the data that came out of, of the, uh, the surveys, I used a couple of uh, statistical methods in ANOVA and uh, Chi-Square. Don't worry about any of the jargon related to the, uh, the statistical methods, it's not that important. But basically, they're both methods of determining whether differences that we see in survey results are really reflections of the of differences that, are, that exist on the ground. That if we see, for example, a really strong difference in the mean scores of two different questions, we use some statistic, uh, statistical methods to see if that, you know, with a certain level of confidence, really is a reflection of the way people feel in real life, or if it's just sort of a coincidence of the data. So I'll be, you know, you'll see a little some numbers and stuff, and don't, don't get hung up on that. I'll explain <coughs> points we need to take away from it. All right. So one of the things that I had them do on the survey was called a cognitive mapping exercise, where I gave them a blank space and asked them simply to draw a map of their homeland. And that was the only instruction they gave. We'll draw a map of their homeland and to, to write or indicate the three most important places within that. It could be cities or, or you know, their house or a site or whatever. So I was interested in seeing what exactly would people draw. What, to what extent do they see their homeland? Where do they see themselves belonging? So, got a whole, whole bunch of different maps. I'm just going to show you a few highlights here. Um, so clearly a lot of people could draw just Crimea. And you can see how that awareness of the, uh, of the uh, logo map, as we are talking about, has sort of been internalized by a lot of people. Because you can see they do a pretty good job of recreating the shape, if you've been paying attention to the way it looks. Yeah. So what word did you use for homeland? 
What's that? What word did you use for homeland? Rodna. Rodna. Yeah. Not capital R. Not capital, little r. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we see a, a variety of uh, Crimea maps here. But then others did include something bigger as their homeland. So we see examples <laughs> of <laughs> Russia or the Soviet Union or you know, however you want to define the, the boundaries here. But if you do notice, at least in all of these, Crimea does maintain a pretty, a pretty strong presence here. Fortunately, it's, it's strong being much larger. And of course, I, I like this one too. Just didn't draw a map, just wrote the three most important places. So Moscow, Peter, St. Petersburg, and Crimea is Russian. Is Russian. Russian Crimea, right? <laughs> all right, and others to Ukraine, all of Ukraine, and these uh, are all are not just from Russian respondents. These are from pulled, uh, pulled from a variety of, of, of respond of participants from different ethnic backgrounds. So um, many did also draw Ukraine as a whole, and you can see Crimea playing a, a prominent role in many of these as well, being proportionally larger than than maybe it ought to be. And a number of people did draw things like this, so maybe their neighborhood, their house, or a schematic map of their, their neighborhood right here. This is, uh, far one over here, is actually Sevastopol, this is sort of the, the bay where they set on Eastern Europe, All right, and you get a couple of just, just the world, right? The world is <laughs> All right, so and here's where some of the numbers get, get weird, so let me just break this down for you. This. Uh, I, I went through all the maps and sort of identified a number of different scales that people use and, and broke them up into these and, and tallied them up. So these are the percentages for each of these, for each, each group. And I broke the, uh, for this part, I broke the Ukrainians into Russified and non-Russified. So I considered them Russified if they listed their nationality as Ukrainian but their native language is Russian, and non-Russified if both their nationality and native language were listed as Ukrainian. And so with the colors, um, Red indicates that there was a statistically significantly higher number of, of, of uh, respondents for this for this scale, meaning that that represents a real a real trend, a real strong trend on the ground. That more people drew this than should have according to the mathematically determined number according to this chi squared test. And blue indicates that it was the other way, that it was statistically significantly lower, that fewer people drew this scale than should have according to the to the test. So we see here, in all cases, Crimea really was very prominently drawn to a very high extent, right? For every every group except for non respite Ukrainians, right? Um, it was the number one most uh, most frequently drawn scale. For for these Ukrainians, Ukraine, as you might suspect, was actually the highest, but then Crimea by itself was second. So the other one with uh, with Russians here, Crimea with something else usually meant. Crimea with maybe part of Russia or part of Ukraine, so not including all of another country along with, with Crimea, but sort of some other chunk attached to it. All right, so what this says is that among all groups, yeah, there is a really strong sense of attachment to Crimea. Right? People feel very strongly, in many cases, that they are from <coughs> Crimea, and that is the most important territory or place to their sense of identity, that they identify this as their homeland. Okay? Now, and this, this really is complicated, don't, don't worry about these numbers. But uh, another, another section of the survey asked them to choose from a list of characteristics that I determined were, were commonly cited as being special or, or significant about Crimea. Asked them to say which of these that they feel is distinguishing or definitive of Crimea. So this is a, you know, run through the list here. So it's autonomous status, it's landscape or climate, the shape of the peninsula, so kind of measuring a familiarity with, with the logo map, right? The dominance of Russians there, the presence of Ukrainians, the presence of Crimean Tatars, the presence of other ethnic groups, uh, its ethnic diversity, the presence of Russian military facilities, especially in uh, Sevastopol, uh, the presence of Ukrainian military facilities because they also operate a naval base out of Sevastopol, uh, the status of Crimea as a place of relaxation, or right, as a tourist destination, its role in past wars, Pre-Russian history, presence of ancient civilizations, the archaeolog its archaeological monuments, and its depiction in art, literature, etc. And so, what you can take away from this table is any of these that are in sort of a, a, a box with the dark lines around it. Those are cases where the group in question chose the given factor significantly more frequently than the other other groups did. So, Russians chose all of these 
more frequently than the other groups. So what we see here is autonomy, landscape, climate, shape of the peninsula, dominance of Russians, clearly, uh, Russian military presence, to, uh, status as a place of relaxation, as a tourist destination, role in past wars, and archaeological monuments. So if we think back to some of those, those uh, key points about the Russian national narrative of Crimea, we see some of these same things emerging. Right? They, they seem to indicate that you know, it's role in past wars, so the Crimean War, World War II, the importance of Sevastopol in both of those, is an important thing for a lot of Russians. So that is a place of relaxation, as a place that Russians and other Soviet people have been vacationing in for a long time. Archaeological monuments, many of which would relate to sort of its Christian roots that we talked about, sort of uncovering yeah. its Christian path, past, clearly dominance of Russians. In line, is, is uh, in line with, with Russian national narratives. Um, but what begins to emerge is that you do sort of see an internalization of these broader Russian national narratives about Crimea emerge, um, emerging in the way people, Russians in Crimea, think about Crimea itself. Okay? So, uh, another section. I asked the uh, participants to simply write a few words that, in their mind, characterize Crimea. I just had a, a blank space in the line, so I'd write some words. So I took all those words, you know, wrote them up, had them up, and uh, actually created a, a word cloud here to sort of just visualize for myself what was it, what emerged as some of the, the major trends here. And so for those of you who can't read Russian here, um, this isn't mob, but uh, moria. <laughs> C, right? So the C, by the far and away, was, was the number one chosen word among all groups. This is not just Russian again. But also we see sun, like uh, recreation, homeland again, mountains, relaxation, nature. Right? So a lot of things related to sort of the, the natural characteristics of it, right? The, the things that people come to enjoy about Crimea. All right? And um, from that, I pulled out the 50 most frequently appearing words from all these. You see the list here, and sort of their, their rough uh, Russian translation. And there's a lot you could pull out of this, and you could you know, play, play one word off of another in different groups, and you could come up with a lot. But one of, the, one of the key things that I pulled out of this, again, using this method to determine which groups chose certain words uh, significantly more frequently than others, is that Russians did use words like elf, so re related to um, so the word help, but also um, you with the prefix drav would be also related to dragnitsa, or like help resort, right? And also resort itself, kurort, um, or resort recreation, kind of somewhere in, the, in between those. Um, so again, sort of reinforcing this idea that Crimea is really important as a place of, of tourism, as a place of, of a destination for relaxation. And this is coming from Russians who live there. This isn't coming from people outside of Crimea who would be coming to, uh, to visit, right? Of course, they're going to be thinking about these things, but those who actually live there, too, have internalized this as an important thing about where they're from and about their region, about Crimea, that this is where people come to relax and to, and to you know, have their vacations. All right, another section uh, in the survey asked participants to say what they think Crimea's political status should be. They gave them a few options. So either remain an autonomous republic in Ukraine, so maintain the status quo, become an oblast of Ukraine, so to lose their autonomous status within Ukraine and become just another non-autonomous region like the rest of, of the oblast of Ukraine, to join Russia as an autonomous republic, so to you know, rejoin Russia or have Crimea annexed by Russia but to maintain its autonomous status, to join Russia as an oblast, so to do the same thing but as a non-autonomous region, so just being another sort of non-ethnic, non-autonomous region within the Russian Federation, to become an independent state, or other. So we've got all the groups here, but we're just going to be talking about the Russians. Um, you can see clearly that almost half chose to join Russia as an autonomous republic. So a lot of them say, yes, we'd like to be part of Russia again. But the, the, the point of the autonomy, I think, is more significant here. So if you look, you compare, they okay, join Russia as an oblast, about 12%. We have uh, remain an autonomous republic of Ukraine at almost twice that, at 21%. So there are m twice as many people who would prefer to address many Russians who prefer to stay in Ukraine, as long as they can maintain their autonomy, then would uh, prefer to become part of Russia without that autonomy. So we combine the two that indicate you know, maintaining autonomy, either in Ukraine or Russia, we get about 70% versus about 16% um, who would give up that autonomy in either case. 
And in my thesis, I, I sort of identify autonomy as a marking of, of the uniqueness of Crimea to, uh, to the people who live there, as an, as a, an acknowledgement of it being the special place that they, that they revere, and that it isn't only about the politics there and having you know, some say in local politics, but in you know, the recognition that it is a special place. Because it, there are a lot of unique factors about its autonomy. It's, it's the only autonomous region in the former Soviet Union that is prim as, or outside of Russia that is an ethnically Russian place, largely, right? It's the only um, uh, area of the Russian diaspora in the former Soviet Union that is autonomous, right? It's the only one that uh, got its autonomy through a referendum, right? So there's some unique things about its autonomous status, and what this says to me is that they internalize that as being something special about where they're from and about who they are as Crimeans. All right, so the following, the last two sections of the survey um, use a Likert scale, ask, you know, a scale of one to five to ask people to rank the importance of, of different factors here. First one asks them to rank how important the following factors are for their self-identity, like how, how important these are to, to who they are. So living in their town, living in Crimea, living in Ukraine, living in Europe, their Soviet past, their nationality, their native language, and their religion. Okay? So again, we're just going to look at results from the Russians here. And so we can see each of these here broken down with the mean scores at the top. Uh, and we see sort of the ones that jump out, native language, clearly the top one, but also religion, nationality, living in Crimea, and a little bit, to a little bit lesser extent living in their town. Sort of jump out as the higher ones here. Now if we look at this um, in terms of statistical significance, um, we see some interesting things. Let me just explain how this works. We see a series of, of bar graphs like this. The black bar indicates the factor in question that we're going to be comparing to the others to test for statistical significance. If the bar is red, it means that it uh, occurred at a statistically significantly higher rate than the black bar. If it's blue, it was lower. And if it was gray, then there are, there's no statistically, statistically significant difference there. All right. Again, don't get, don't get too hung up on the jargon. But basically, what this says is that compare living in Crimea to their native language, and the native language was, uh, was significantly higher, statistically speaking. So that's clearly the number one thing. Um, but if we compare it to living in their town, their nationality, and their religion, we see no real difference in the, in the statistical significance between these. Um, and if we look again at their nationality, we see the same, the same thing. There's sort of, in between these four factors, you know, even though there's a little variation in the means, they're all more or less you know, of the same importance, as you can speak, <laughs> to Russians here, right? And if we look at uh, just the one here with the native language, it is clearly higher than, than all the others. And if we look at living in Ukraine, almost all of these are, are significantly higher, except for living in Europe. So basically, what this says is that Russians don't really feel that, that living in Ukraine is, is, is that important to, to their sense of identity, but living in Crimea, to a lesser extent living in their town, is about on par with these three factors, which could all be kind of considered part of, of national identity, right? Your nationality itself, but also your native language and your religion, right? So where they're living in Crimea and their sense of national identity are kind of on par, right? It's kind of, in general, they're, they're somewhat equally significant for their sense of self-identity, you could say. All right, but how does that play out? So what does that mean? What does it mean that they identify about as strongly with where they live and with their, the trappings of their nationality? So if we kind of parse this out and see how strongly they identify with different groups and at different scales, then we can kind of see some important patterns emerging. So the last part of the survey asks them again to rank on scale of one to five, how strongly they identify with the following groups. So I broke these down and said, members of your nationality and members of all nationalities living within each of the following scales. Your town, Crimea, Ukraine, Europe, the former Soviet Union, and worldwide. So each of those was an option. It said, members of your nationality living in your town, members of all nationalities living in your town. Members of your nationality in Crimea, members of all nationalities in Crimea, etc. All right, so this is what comes out of this. So the blue bars represent the uh, how strongly they identify with other Russians at each of these scales, and the green for all nationalities at each of these scales. And clearly we see that at each scale, they identify more strongly with other Russians than they do with, with all people. So there is a sense of national solidarity at each, that exists at each of these scales for, for, people, for Russians in Crimea. And if we check for statistical significance, then we do see it's, it is statistically significant in every case. That this 
can speak with 95% confidence, that's what this means with the, the confidence interval, that these differences are not coincidental, aren't, aren't just kind of a fluke in the data, that this really does represent a real difference on the ground. All right, now if we kind of break this down into separate groups, so now we're just looking at how strongly they identify with people of all nationalities at each of these scales. We got rid of the other Russian bars, we're looking at just the all nationalities bars now. So if we check Crimea versus any of these other scales, we see no statistical significance between, in the differences between any of these. So what this says is that there isn't any particularly strong sense of sort of a pan-ethnic Crimean identity, that they don't feel a certain sense of solidarity with all the people in Crimea, right? We know that they, that many of them consider it to be their homeland, that there's a strong attachment to it, but apparently this doesn't translate into a sense of solidarity among all the people who live there. Right? There's still something, there's still some distinction between, you know, your, your ethnic identity within the region versus your just plain regional identity that would include all the people who live there, right? So then if we look at just the, uh, how strongly they identify with other Russians, each of these scales, so we're getting rid of the all nationalities bars, and we compare Crimea to others, the only time we see any sort of statistical significant dis uh, difference is when we compare Crimea to Europe and worldwide. All right, so there isn't, doesn't appear to be any sort of sense of identity with a Russian diaspora, per se, in Europe or worldwide. But when it comes to any of these scales, which all sort of fall in the, the Soviet realm, right, their town, Crimea, Ukraine, former Soviet Union, there is, you know, more or less the same sense of solidarity among those Russians. So there's a, a sense of Russian ethnic identity pervasive at each of these scales. Right, so what this says is that there isn't a particularly strong sense of identity with Russians within Crimea. There's no sense of a Crimea, uh, ethnically Russian Crimean community. That's no more important to them that, you know, they're another, another Russian in Crimea feels any closer than another Russian in Ukraine, in Russia, and anywhere else in the former Soviet Union. Okay, so what Crimean Russian identity would mean is not that it would mean that it, it mean that uh, it's a sense of community among Russians only in Crimea. Okay, so that's all the data that I'm culled from from uh, the survey and put it together in sort of these broad conclusions about what Crimean Russian identity would mean. So residents of Crimea tend to view the region through their own national lens. This is sort of the language I, I use in my thesis which emphasizes certain characteristics that are significant in their own national narratives about Crimea. And this is actually true for Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians too. Didn't have the time to go into it in this presentation. Had to pair it to the, just to the Russian side uh, for, these, for this purpose. Um, but also Russian, uh, Crimean Russian identity does not denote a common sense of identity among Russians living in Crimea specifically, as I just explained, but rather an understanding of an attachment to Crimea viewed through a Russian national lens. Now what it means to have to be Crimean Russian, if we want to use that term, is an attachment to Crimea and an understanding of it and a relation to it through these national narratives about you know, its military significance, its, its, its status as a, uh, as a tourist destination, right? its Christian roots, all these things. The thing that made Crimea important to Russians in a broader sense, that, that place it within these Russian national narratives at large. So, just to reiterate what I just said, so those who exhibit, exhibit a sense of Crimean Russian identity emphasize Crimea's place within Russian Soviet national narratives, particularly its important role in Russian and Soviet military history, especially that of Sevastopol, and its status as an important center of Soviet post Soviet tourism. So, those are the conclusions that I came to in my thesis using this survey. And uh, with that, uh, I am finished, and I welcome your questions. Yeah.